McKenzie, space again, gets the pass away for Lampy! Yes, welcome along to the official New Zealand Rugby Podcast. This is the connection between those that play the game and the passionate global supporters of Rugby Union. I'm your host, Jay Reeve. I'll be guiding the ship around. And next to me, uh, Rob Roundy Dunn. Welcome along, Roundy. How are Good, mate. Pretty pumped up. First one. I reckon this is going to be a cracker show. This is exciting times. Our first guest is a man that needs absolutely no introduction, but because this is a podcast, we will give him one. He was born and raised in the Garden City. ALB. ALB. Lenny first pulled on the Marist Albion jersey back in 2000, often plying his trade in the front row or even at hooker before realising that he couldn't even throw a dart straight. And liking the look of what the backs did at training, he made the move to the midfield. Since then, he hasn't looked back, and since playing for the Chiefs before he even played club rugby, he managed to get an all-black debut in 2016 and is now a core member of the team with 43 tests under the belt. Welcome along to the official New Zealand Rugby podcast. Podcast, Anton Leonard Brown, buddy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, Jay, thanks for that intro. Does it take pleasure, you back? Pleasure to be here. It does take me back. Fizzing, fizzing away. This is, I mean, this is, there is a lot resting on your shoulders. Basically, the success of this whole operation. I know. I'm a bit nervous, to be honest. <laughs> First podcast, don't want to let you down, but I'll try my best. Nah, mate, I think you'll, I think you'll do us well. Just, just be natural. Just go with it, buddy. But, um, you know, you're, we'll uh, we've done some research. I think we've got good, some good stuff on you. Perfect. Let's play, let's just wind back the clock a little bit. Uh, footy stop for the Chiefs on March the thirteenth uh, against the Canes. You went into lockdown and uh, everything basically since then has been turned on its head. But just prior to that, uh, you put pen to paper. Or was it the ninth or the eighth of March where you uh, dedicated yourself to New Zealand rugby until twenty twenty three? Yeah, it was actually earlier on in the year, in around January, I put pen to paper. But obviously, they announced it at a different time, so. Actually worked out quite well probably because obviously COVID hit. We don't really know what's going on at the moment with all the competition. So I guess for me it was good timing. Mate, you went four years. Um, you know, people do different terms of contracts. Any reason you went through to 2023? Was it getting through to the next World Cup? Was it a bit of, um, you know, knowing your future? Um, you know, some guys do go one year or two years, four for you. Yeah, I guess I just love playing rugby here in New Zealand and um, – I guess with the World Cup disappointment last year, um, that's definitely front of mind. Hopefully I uh, can play some good code over the next four years and get another crack at it. We'll be touching on that uh, later on in the podcast. Uh, but training through lockdown, what does that look like? Everyone everyone uh, learned how to make bread, uh, TikTok <laughs> dance their way through it, and uh, obviously you and the team stay digitally, digitally connected. How, how did you do that? What did you do? What did training look like during lockdown? Um, yeah, I was lucky enough to move in uh, with a good mate of mine, Damien McKenzie. Um, he had a wee gym set up. Oh, I managed to get a Watt bike just before lockdown, and uh, every day would go into the gym and pump some guns, jump on the bike, um, and then put the feet up for the rest of the day. So Mate, it worked out really well. That, they must have done a roaring trade. Like every single man and their dog picked up a Watt bike over there. Obviously, oh. you've got them where you train, but yeah. did you get to peel stuff out of the gym, or was this just you had to personally invest? No, you had to personally invest, and um, honestly, like trying to find gym equipment online was almost impossible because I guess every Kiwi in New Zealand wanted to yeah. wanted a home gym, and they're like, "This is the perfect opportunity." Yeah, those people must have made a killing. It's exactly why I didn't go out there and buy gym equipment because I knew that people like yourself in the professional arena were the ones that needed it, and that was that was my gift Thanks to you. Thanks for thinking of us. Yeah, you're a good man, mate. You're what did man. uh you pumped out some tin in the morning? I saw uh, on social, you know, a few chipping competitions with Jim because you both love your golf. What about uh when it came to the cooking? Who was um who was running the cutter? Were we rotating? You know, did you add to your repertoire of feeds um, and use the opportunity to uh you know get right for date night? Like, what was the go? Yeah, so it was Damo, myself, and Damo's cousin came yep. down, and she was like an unbelievable cook. Like the things we probably can't cook, but we sort of learnt a little bit off her. Um, and then would she would go like one night each. The weekends would be, I don't know, bacon and eggs on toast, just be nice and simple. Um, but did I add to my repertoire? <laughs> <laughs> From bacon and eggs on toast. <laughs> I prom I promised myself. Well, I went through lockdown, I was like, you know, I've been reading books, I've been cooking well, make, obviously you make your own lunch, you do your own breakfast. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm pumped, I'm pumped for level one because, 
You know, I'm a changed man. <laughs> um, went back to level one, takeaways every second night, yeah. <laughs> go out for brekkie, you know, just within a week I lost it all. But um, what did I learn? What did I learn cooking-wise? Um, did a bit of baking, make a nice uh, chocolate chip cookie now. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. All right. Um, Baby steps, eh? Yep. Baby steps. Anything else? Mate, What's if you had... A green, you had green curry is my go-to. Oh, green there curry. Go. There it is. Uh, st- steak and chips. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is real Gordon Ramsay stuff. Japanese Ramsey's curry, wraps. Yeah. Mate, no, I didn't add to my repertoire. I can't lie to you. Yeah. So. Just finesse. Just finesse Just what fin- you were already doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. cook an unbelievable poached egg now. Oh, there we go. Yeah. The cafe style one, or those nice little rolled ones? No, nah, the cafe style ones. Like, they are like perfectly cooked. What's the secret to that? Have you been watching Nats, well, what I reckon? So, Damo taught me this, but he boils the pan to really high. Oh, yeah. So, it's boiling. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah. For the boiled egg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. You, you boil the pan so it's boiling, yeah. Um, and then you turn it on low, chuck the eggs in, um, and then you just let them simmer. So it probably takes them about like four or five minutes to, I guess, become a really nice poached egg. But I feel as though doing it that way, there's less room for error yep. because you've got it on a high heat. The initial high heat like sort of cooks the egg, and then it just simmers. So take it out when it's ready i know this is a podcast so people yeah. can't actually see us we're all on the edge of our seats listening to this this is great yeah, stuff i really, really appreciate it did that give you a new appreciation of your job when you're in lockdown and you're fe- you're figuring out how terrible you are at cooking uh, how expensive it is to buy your own gym equipment when you get back to training when you're able to get back into training does it give you a whole new appreciation of what what is effectively your job being a professional sports person yeah i guess it it certainly did and it probably gave me a good perspective on life. Um, what if footy was taken away? Um, well, obviously you wouldn't be locked down, but you sort of got that feeling that um, there is more more to footy um, than, than, I guess, what we live day day by day. So yeah, there, was, there was plenty of learnings in amongst it. Um, just, I guess, little things, um, things you got to appreciate. Um, and one thing I probably took out of it the most was, like, I guess setting a time, uh, setting. What am I trying to say? Setting some time aside. Yeah, the, there we go for myself, because yep. I actually really enjoyed. Um, I guess just having my own time and just resting. Like I'm someone that always has to be doing something, always on the move. Um, so now I sort of consciously try to set aside some time for myself uh, each day, and I guess just refresh the mind. Because you, obviously we'll touch on this in depth a little bit later on, but the, your journey into professional footy was a rapid one and mm. and there were no breaks, basically, and you haven't had a chance that even through even through injury, haven't really had a chance to pump the brakes. So you, as a teenager till now in your, in your early mid-20s, did you ever get a chance to sort of develop a hobby other than being a professional? How does ALB chill when he gets a little bit of downtime? You get your Wednesday, instead of hanging out with two of the greatest looking individuals to ever run a podcast, how do you spend your Wednesday? You guys are good looking men, got to say. Eh? Thanks, mate. They'll get you a long way. Yeah, you a long, <laughs> long way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, sorry. Walked into that <laughs> one. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great, great question, and it's probably something I had to, I guess, learn over my years. It's the toughest thing about professional footy. Like, I wouldn't say it's the lifestyle. I wouldn't say it's a schedule. Like, we've got it all good, but it's it's the mental element. It's that you're on your day off, but you're still thinking about, oh, on Saturday I got to perform. Yeah. Um, on a Sunday after a game, you're thinking, oh, what if I did this better? So it's 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 really like it's mental, and it can be really taxing. Um, How much time do you give yourself uh, after a game just to decompress before you just go? There is nothing I'm going to do now that'll change the outcome of what happened on the weekend. I just need to cut and run forward from here. Yeah, it's, do you have a process? Like, is that something? Say for taught? example, on the weekend, like we lost, um, and you know we're a much better team than we played. Um, and personally, like, I felt as though I could have played better. And, it probably wasn't until Monday where I reset. I like to do some meditation. Um, and I was like, oh, well, like this is a new week. Um, a chance to, I guess, put things right. Um, so it did take a good couple of days to, I guess, really clear it from my mind. But after the game, I enjoy a beer or two uh, with my mates. Uh, my family were down and done at the yeah, time. So awesome. 
I guess I've just got to consciously put that aside and be like, I haven't seen my family in two months. I've got to go spend time with them. In all honesty, I didn't really feel like it because I felt as though like we lost and I could have been better and all that stuff. But and you've got to see the face across the table from you that bet you. Yeah, and my your brother's brother. playing Hollanders <laughs> and he's got a smile on his face. And I'm like, <laughs> stuff you. Yeah, you did say earlier on the week that um, you're going to smash him and hope that he'd run it straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. Did. he did run it straight, actually. <laughs> but I didn't smash him. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just all those, I guess, mental challenges come into play. Um, and... I'd say, like, as a professional rugby player or professional sports person or anything, like, that's where you probably make your money. Yeah. It's not It's not the physical yeah. aspect. Um, we're lucky we get a gym every day. It's not the schedule um, we have because it's awesome. Like, we get one day off a week. Like, we train in the morning. We, we train for a living. You've got your best mates around you, but it, it's more just the mental aspect of the game. Um, you always think you're a rugby. You've, you've got an expectation you have to perform and you've got to be on. You can't turn up on a Tuesday training and be off. Yeah. Like you, you, you got to turn up for the boys. You've got to be on every day. Yeah, mate. And it's, it's in this new world, like it's so many things could potentially change. We don't know yet. There's so many unknowns, but you know, um, to try and look at what could be the positives that come out of it all, um, to get your opinion as a player, like talking about a global calendar, talking about the, maybe the July test matches moving to October, talking about playing, a little bit more rugby domestically, whether we go to South Africa and Argentina for Super Rugby or not. And while you know they are often great opposition and 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 probably fun tours, also kind of like we we're talking about beforehand off camera. Does how much sense does it make to play rugby one week in South Africa, one week in Argentina, and then maybe the next week back in New Zealand? Like surely, um, you know, we need to have a rethink about that from player recovery and cost as well. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I think, as you said, like we talked about it off screen and um, it's not until you sit back and like you reflect yeah. on what travel you're doing that you think how crazy it was. Yeah. Like, you're literally going around the globe within three weeks and you're playing three games within like three different countries. It's, it's pretty crazy, really. Um, but it was just what we did. Yeah. So it's probably not until this point um, you think, she's a lot, we're actually doing that. And it, it is possible, like, as we've done it, like we've done it, like you can do it, but is it the best thing for us? Um, did I enjoy travelling to South Africa? In all honesty, like the first time was great, but the second, third, fourth, fifth time, you, you got a bit over it. Did I enjoy going from South Africa to Argentina back to New Zealand? Your sleep cycle's out. Um, same again, in all honesty, probably not. Yeah. Um, but it's just what we did. Um, but. Like you said, I think this is a great opportunity for, I guess, Sansa, um, New Zealand, World Rugby to rethink uh, a better structure, um, better for the players, better for the fans, um, and something we can move forward with. Because I think we, I think sometimes you just get stuck in a way and you just do it because that's the way you've always done it and that's you know it just becomes the routine and how you're mm. always operating. So yeah. when something like this and there's a good extended break where you can actually stop down and take stock of, of what it is that you're doing and on top of that as well when you add in that the way that global rugby has changed and the number of people that have been overseas that are now coming back you go well maybe, maybe we need to kind of focus a little bit more on what it is that we're doing at home the mm. uh, super rugby Aotearoa comp being like yeah. mate, that's exciting yeah. like every every weekend every you know last weekend was a, a classic example of people yeah. just getting fizzed up to All see right. these crowds there that they haven't seen at super rugby for I could probably a decade, you know, or at least for unless until the business end of it. It's pretty impressive stuff. Yeah, and I th like in my opinion, New Zealand's screaming out for provincial rugby to be revamped, and I feel as though like, oh, so I feel as though the All Blacks need to be playing in that comp. Yep. Um, and this year is a great opportunity for that. Like the provincial rugby's are screaming out for it. Imagine if there was just in the middle there a little cheeky north south game, and then who would uh, Anton Leonard Brown <laughs> represent? You know, as a bit of a um, you know transient rugby player over the years, like where would you be uh, putting your uh, allegiances, mate, if there was to be that fixture chucked in there? Well, I think I know the criteria now, and it's your first provincial interesting um, rugby side. Well, that's niggly for you because you didn't ever play any provincial rugby. You just went straight to super. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. But then I came back and played provincial. But um, yep. in all honesty, like my heart would lie in the South Island because um, I grew up there. 
Um, and Christchurch Boys is somewhere I'm very Aotearoa pedo as. <laughs> um, it's somewhere that like, I'm so proud to have been to that school um, and I feel as though like, I'm connected to the South Island there. Um, so, And I also feel that like the South Island's like the little brother. Yeah. You know, I'd love to be an underdog team and versus the North Island team. And that's, but um, that's you, that's Jim, that's Damien McKenzie. That's Damien McKenzie, McKenzie that's Guzzler. Brodie Ritalik. Um, but funnily enough, the way it's structured would all be playing in the North Island. Interesting. Oh, Watch this space. And talking about fan engagement, mate. Um, you wind know, it back. Super footy. Wind yep. it in, mate. Wind it in. A sight that just a few weeks ago seemed scarcely possible. Eden Park is back in business, a capacity crowd of 43,000, and they are pouring in ahead of this Super Rugby Aotearoa clash between the Blues and the Hurricanes. Mate, how about that? Like, uh, when you talk about, um, you know, wanting to invigorate the game, well, a bit of scarcity, you know, uh, what is it? Quality over quantity, like, that all came to roost on over the weekend. Big turnout at your game and, and Sunday afternoon, 43,000 at Eden Park. You don't get that unless it's the ABs normally. Yeah. Oh, it's it's awesome to see. And um, I guess, obviously, having a break from rugby for so long got the fans excited. Obviously, Baz and DC um, <laughs> made some excitement around the Blues, so they got the fans in as well. But... How good was it to see an Arvo game too? Oh, I mean, the so, sun was yeah. shining. So good, eh? Um, it was dry, it was fast, it was good quality rugby. And like you said, it was a packed stadium. Um, it's what rugby needs. Um, and it, it's great to see that the fans really got behind it. Taking it down to Forsyth Bar, uh, you guys run out. You're basically the flagship for, for global sport, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere of, you know, big crowd sport. Everyone else has kind of been parked away. You've got cutouts of fans and grandstands and other, and other codes. <laughs> and you haven't been in front of a crowd yourselves for, what, the best part of two months. Yeah. Uh, so how did, how did that feel, running back out and onto that platform and playing in front of a very, a very vocal Southern crowd? <laughs> it was exciting. Um, you know, I was I was so pumped for the game. I can't remember being that pumped um, <laughs> in a long in a long time. Um, and because of COVID and obviously the government rules, like everything was happening so fast. So, you know, only a week and a half ago there was no crowds, and then and then Jacinda announced it's level one. There can be crowds. So everything happened so fast, and I just got so excited and. To play in front of the zoo, um, and in between the breaks, they pumped some D and B, some drum and bass, yeah. <laughs> and they're just, they're just going off like, "How cool is that?" Um, I love playing under the roof. It's loud in there. Um, it's obviously dry, and I was just yeah, like I said, I was just so excited to get back out there in front of a crowd. And there's obviously after a decent rest, the bodies of the bodies must be in pretty tip top nick as well because, like you said, there's this is the part of the season where there's a lot of broken down carcasses, yeah. but everyone for the most part is is running on you know yeah, all honey. twelve cylinders, and uh, and and as a result of that, there's some pretty impressive footy. Yeah, like everyone's fresh. Look, I I don't think there's ever been a two three month break for rugby players to not play rugby. Not being de- not doing contact and just train like it's great for the body. Um, and I'm sure long term it's going to help as well. But like you said, everyone's fresh, everyone's fit, and are ready to go. And there's eight rounds of or ten rounds of derbies. Um, yeah. and I'm sure it's going to be quality, quality footy. And you know, derbies, New Zealand derbies to me is the closest you'll get to Test match footy. Um, you know, everyone wants those bragging rights. Everyone goes that little bit harder. Um, and the intensity. Just goes right up. You're literally playing your mates, aren't you? Your brother. Yeah. You're even playing yeah. with your brother. <laughs> right. yeah. That is um, how close to home it is. So mm. you're always just going to find a little bit extra against the boys, aren't you? Yeah, you sure are. How does how does that split uh, in terms of support? Uh, you talked about family being in the crowd. <laughs> Do you sort of divvy out tickets? Is it a kind of uh, is it a sort of or well, this is where you really find out who the favourites are? <laughs> Uh, are there yeah. j- jerseys that are sewn together, made up of both jerseys? You know, like what what does the situation look like? Well, it's quite tough. It was tough being on the losing side after the game because I saw my old man before the game and he was wearing a Chiefs hat. And post the game, he had a Highlanders one on. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> oh, okay. And then he had a puffer jacket on and it had the Chiefs jersey underneath. But and he zipped zip right up. up. <laughs> zip right up. Um, oh, boy. Yeah, and he 
he promises me that he's a Chiefs supporter, but um, I guess he went with the winners on Saturday. But Mum's actually got this polo, so we gave her, Dan gave her a Highlanders polo, I gave her a Chiefs one, and she's cut it in half. She did. And she's, so she's so on this polo, it's half Chiefs, half Highlanders, and that's what she wears. Mm. There it is. And mate, like there was obviously, um, you know, it's a fresh start for the refs and there's been some um, new rule interpretations as well. Did you get much of a heads up around what the refs were going to focus on ahead of the game so you could prep or, or um, was it is literally like with a lot of games of footy, it's about being able to adapt while you're out there? Yeah, we spoke a lot about the new rules, um, I guess, before the game and we had a in-house scenarios game uh, where one of the refs came in and sort of spoke to us about the new rules and then we got to trial it out against each other. Um, but still in the weekend, like, it was weird. Um, these the, the new rules and it always takes time to adjust. Yep. I think eventually um, it's probably going to speed up the game, but for now there's going to be a lot of penalties. It's going to take a while to get used to. Um, and that is frustrating for a player and for a fan because I think both games had 30 penalties in the weekend and that makes it a bit stop-start. But once we get two, three, four rounds into, I guess, Super Rugby Aotearoa, um, the teams will get used to it. The footy will speed up and we'll get better quality. Do you feel like when you're when you're standing on attack that you don't have to stack so deep because you've actually got an extra you feel like you've got an extra couple of meters and then when you're defending, do you feel like you know, there's a bit of space yeah. for these people to run at you? Because the other thing is too, with less people being committed to a ruck, all of a sudden when you look up you've got thirteen players in front of you that you're having to run through as opposed to, you know, dragging forwards in and stacking them up around the ruck, you know, having sort of five or six of the big boys in there you know, frees up mm. a bit of space for you. What's it like in the in the back line now as opposed to sort of pre these rules coming in? Yeah, I, I don't even really like think of it like that, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> um, I just, you know. Um, but you're right, because they're, they're going hard on the offsides. Um, and to be honest, I don't think teams have quite adjusted to taking a step yet. Yeah. Like, it's going to take a while. And in all honesty, like, as a player, you want to be right on the edge. Like, you always yeah. want to be... Like up as fast as you can, so you want to be testing um, the ref whether you're on on side or not. But now the touchies are looking at it all the time, and if you look, if it's a fifty fifty call, they're going to give it. They're going to say you're offside. Um, so you, you've got to take a step, and I guess as you said, that will give more time for the attack, um, and also going to more players on feet. I feel as though when the ball's in play, because there's not as many people in the ruck, or it's harder. What, once you've missed the ball, you can't keep hunting. Yeah. So it actually speeds up play. So when the ball's really quick, those play, those uh, players aren't set. So it actually gives you a better opportunity to attack. Mm. Mate, it was it was interesting to watch in the first game. Um, you know, basically back in the world with crowds was a hell of a game. Now here's the drop kick from McKenzie. And through it goes. Damien McKenzie lands the drop kick. And with just under left and the Chiefs are in front by two. They're either going to try a drop goal, Mitch Hunt. No, in fact it's Gatlands. <laughs> yeah, obviously when you, when you hear it like that, how was that when you uh, when you get back into the sheds and uh, you look at the coach and he was beaten by his son, <laughs> effectively? Was, that, was there any mention of that? Obviously it's probably t- still a little bit too raw straight after the game, but how? I mean, just to show how smaller nation we are and how close these, these connections are. Like yeah. The roots that run through New Zealand rugby are just, just unlike anywhere else in the world, you'd have to say. In a way, like you've got to sit back and sort of chuckle at yourself and think, is there a better, uh, better tale to tell? You yeah. know, yeah. Our coach's son had just kicked the the winning drop goal, and I said to Getty after the game, I said, you know, you made a mistake 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I said, can we... Can you just we... needed that one more drink, didn't you? You need to take it I to said, that fancy restaurant. Can we go back there? <laughs> can you not do that? <laughs> no, I, I didn't quite say that. Um, but, yeah, it was obviously, like, disappointing, and I think I heard, or I saw something on Instagram about Getty saying, I don't care, it was my son, I'm still gutted we lost. Yeah. Um, but surely deep down you've got to have some pride um, 
Yeah, mate. Well, you know, didn't yeah. Bryn post up the picture of uh, the text from his dad saying, well, there goes your Christmas present this year. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> 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 Sounds about right. Um, oh, mate, it was, yeah. like you say, you can't you can't write that script. But, um, you know, for you, obviously, feeling in the changing room afterwards, pretty disappointed. You had all that time to prep and, and on, like you say, the excitement going into the game, yeah. knowing it was going to be a massive crowd, kind of literally getting rugby started globally in some ways. And your boys just didn't execute on the day? Yeah, and... The most disappointing thing is that is that we had a really good week leading up, yep. like one of our best trainings week, training weeks we had all year, um, obviously pre-COVID, um, and there was a really good feeling going into the game, um, but maybe one of the biggest lessons we could take from it is that we probably were a bit excited, we're trying to throw those miracle balls, maybe we're trying to impress in front of the, the zoo, um, <laughs> maybe ESPN Canada yeah, and America yeah. got us excited and we're like, I'm going to throw this miracle ball so um, LeBron James might be watching and be like, yeah, yeah. man, that guy's good. Yeah. <laughs> but get but anyways, like you said, like, execution just wasn't there. Um, and, you know, full credit to the Highlanders. They played well. Um, their four pack really stepped up and they did some nice stuff in the backs. Um, but for us, we just weren't clinical enough and we're a better team than that. That's the most disappointing thing is that I can – we can live with losing if we play well, but we were nowhere near our best. So, But there's it's an easy fix. We just need to be more clinical. It wasn't our systems. It wasn't our structures. Just individually, we need to do a little bit better. Uh, Sammy Kane out, missed it. Uh, looking like he well, he might have a late run this week to get into the uh, get into the fold for the weekend coming up. What did he say as a, as a, as a um, well, not that he was skipped that game, but he's kind of the senior figurehead that you all look to in terms of the player. What's he like as a captain, and uh, does he get dark in moments like that? Um, he didn't say too much about the game, really. Um, he sort of refocused refocused us for this week, um, and he's someone that leads by actions, and he's great with his words as well. He doesn't say too much, but he always says the right things, but. Because he wasn't out there, he's not someone that would yep. be like, "Oh, you guys should have done this better." He was, he just asked us, um, "What was the feeling?" Um, and I guess we we found a solution from how we we're feeling. He wasn't like, "Oh, I thought you needed to do this better or that better." He was more of that that positive voice saying, "You know, you guys weren't clinical enough, but we're a much better team than that, and we've got the Blues this weekend, and there's no better team to turn that around against." Speaking of the Blues, mm. uh, they mm. had an absolute, well, an absolute blinder, and that was an interesting game in itself. When you when you look at uh, the injection of Bowden Barrett playing against his old team, and by geez, didn't the boys love getting into him? <laughs> Especially <laughs> seeing <laughs> seeing Colsey <laughs> uh, seeing Colsey run straight through him to get a try. That was great stuff. I mean, he's a very hard man to stop, and he's very quick. He's deceptively quick, isn't he? Mm. And he's a, he's a a large muscle mass moving at a very low centre of gravity. Uh, his legs only make up a quarter of his overall body length, so it's very hard to get them in at, at, at a time like that. <laughs> Apparently he's uh, offered up his socks in which he ran over the top of Bowden Barrett for option oh. as well. Um, so if you want to get around that, that's great stuff. How do you guys uh, frame yourselves up against a Blues team? that? Because obviously this is a shortened competition. Blues are mm. looking on fire. They've been written off for, for years. People are saying that it's the difference being made with, uh, with Desi being brought into the fold with Bowden uh, and the mixer at the back there. But they were great before the lockdown mm, as well. Yeah, they, were playing, playing they were playing incredible code. And across the entire team, they're looking sharp. So it's all well and good that you focus on shutting down the likes. Or you, you'll you know, because Bodie will be sifting in and amongst that and you've played outside him so so much. Yeah, you yeah. sort of know how he operates. Mm. But with a whole team that's got you know 15 players that can attack from anywhere, where, where do you start? Yeah, I think we've got to start with ourselves. Like I said, yeah. um, we need to be more clinical uh, than last week. And I've got full belief in our squad. I've got an outstanding squad, but so do we. Um, and we've just got to trust ourselves that we can go out and do the business. And I think we coughed up the ball, including penalties, about nearly about 30 times last week. Yep. And you can just, you can't win a game that way. Um, and we got close, that's the thing. Like we mm. had mom like great moments, but this week against, against the Blues, we've just got to worry about ourselves, make our tackles. We know the a great outfit, but we've got to have that self-belief in ourselves that we're a great team as well. Um, and if we can half the amount of errors we had last week, um, I think it's going to be a great match. How good, though? Like, how good? We're back into it. We've got crowds. Mm. 
the team that was perhaps struggling a little bit before the break got on the front foot. The Landers got a win. They'll be stoked. The Chiefs were playing really well before the break. You've got the Blues who are on a bit of a resurgence. Yeah. You know, guys like uh, Young Clark was outstanding on the wing. The number eight, Satutu, was um, outstanding. And then the Crusaders' first game this weekend, like local derbies every week, like this is going to be phenomenally yeah. tight comp. Like it is set up extremely well. It's yeah. going to be good to get home, Lenny, in front of your home crowd and uh, give it a wind against the Blues. Yeah, it's it's awesome. And like I said, Super Rugby New Zealand derbies are the closest you'll get to test match footy. Yep. So for us, we've got four games in a row. It's like four test matches in a row. Um, and that's the feeling out there. Um, there's so much hype around it. There's so much intensity. Um, and to see the fans getting behind us is just amazing. And there's no better place for us to play than FMG Stadium Waikato. Um, one of the well, it is the greatest stadium in the world. What do you reckon? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The pla- you should see the grass. Like I reckon it's got the best <laughs> field. Like the grass is pristine. Is that every uh, time? Hey, Big Carl Have you ever ventured down mate, there? Are you too cool for us, mate. I've done. I've done. A, I've done a couple of uh, uh, undie runs on, oh, on, on, on the paddock. Oh, I'll yeah. tell you, one of the features that I really love about the stadium is on the not so developed side. I think it's in the uh, the Waikato Rugby Union members. The bathrooms downstairs, in the cubicles, in the stalls. Yeah, they are that tight that you can't even open the door. Like once you sit down in there, you jam your knees back against <laughs> oh, the back yeah. of the door. Like I don't think they have locks on them because you don't need them. Because you cannot get in if someone's in there. Oh. But have you tried to go from a seated position to standing off the croucher? Mate, it's hard. It takes a lot of cool strength, cool strength that I don't have. And I've been oh. caught there a couple of times. So just, they've got a... They've got a, a, a Typical th- Aucklander, eh? <laughs> just complain. I've plenty. Oh, so, I've well, plenty. You're in Auckland You've been acclimatised. Yeah. Yeah, you've been yeah, up yeah. here too long. If, you've there's not a speed, if there's not a speedway Sorry, ring mate. around my paddock, I don't want to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll roll the red carpet out for you next time. <laughs> mate, he's <laughs> the chameleon. Call him the chameleon, mate. He can... Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's unreal. Just but lastly, mate, on Super... Before we move on, um, yeah. you know, big change as well down at the Chiefs is having Gats there this year. And even though he is, you know, Waikato, Waikato born and bred, you know, he is a part of that area, but he's been away a long time. Yeah. Um, it's probably pretty exciting to have one, a really, really well respected coach. He's done some stuff um, away, but two, um, change of scenery, fresh, fresh voice, you know, like has it been good times with him? Yeah, it's awesome. And um, Gaddy's a great man. And I think one thing about every great coach is they're so good with their players. Yep. They've got this ability to get around everyone. Everyone knows where they, what they need to do within the team. Um, and he knows when he's got to put the harsh word down, but he also knows to knows when to have a joke with you. Yeah. Um, and every great coach can interact with every individual in the team um, and get to know them. And that's what Gaddy does so well. But like you said, at the same time, he's been in the Northern Hemisphere for a while now and he's definitely brought some fresh ideas um, some different things to our training um, which is great like one thing one of his philosophies is that you don't train on field for over an hour okay. which is which is, but it's what's, <laughs> and what's the rationale and behind that well hasn't explained it yet <laughs> yeah well, I find it great <laughs> but so his everything's high intensity so right like everything's like bang on the minute so so for example, eight minutes warm up, it might be six minutes attack, six minutes to tackle, and it goes, it's always under an hour pretty much. He, he might put up on the board 54 minutes, and you you just go from from drill to drill to drill to drill, but it's all high intensity, and funnily enough, so we have high mets, so we've got GPSs, and for example, last year when Gaddy's, Gaddy wasn't there, we were doing two-hour training sessions, but there'll be high intensity and then there'd be like a long break. Like it was a lot slower. But we are doing as, as much high mets, if not more now, in the hour session than we were in, yeah. in two hours. We'll do, it's just a lot shorter and sharper and it's more high intensity. I suppose that mirrors game time, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Mm. Yeah, because the ball is in play, I think, during a game for about, it might be like 30, 34, 35 minutes. Um, yeah. Once you got your scrum, your line outs, your penalties, your, your goal kicks. So yep. if you think about it, you're actually not at a high intensity for any longer than 40 minutes in a game. So I think that's his philosophy around it. Why train? For, why be on your feet for two hours? So we, we go high intensity, um, but then we get off our feet 
and what it what it does for you on Saturday is awesome because you you're fresh and you're ready to go. Mate, awesome. Don't forget your roots, my friend, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that we wanted to focus on uh, in this podcast was actually taking it back to where it all began. I know that it's something that you're very passionate about. We could you know, obviously your rapid rise to professional footy almost had you blast instantly straight past any form of uh, senior club rugby. If we could bring it back even a little bit more to even before that, like where you first laced up, or where you first, where were you first dropped off, and at what age did you uh, did it get into the game of rugby? Um, yeah, I laced up at one of the great clubs in Christchurch, <laughs> Marist Albion. Um, actually, that's where Richie Monga started as well. Um, Solomon Alamalo. Yep. Uh, yeah, so we had a few of us that went on, um, but I was four years old when the old man took me down there. Um, and it was just touch at the time, touch and bare feet. And then I guess it just slowly went up the grades um, until I got to high school. Mate, you had yeah. some uh, good, yeah, did Critter, Benny Blair, coach you at some stage? Um, did he chuck that out there? Or maybe he's been coaching the Maris Senior Club, I think, hasn't he? Like down in Christchurch. Um, he was definitely around. Yeah. So he, I think he came to a couple of our trainings. Yeah. Um, a man called Stu Black coached us oh, for many brilliant. years. Brilliant. Um, yeah, he's great. <laughs> He's a great man. He was like sort of that that grumpy, that <laughs> grumpy dad. Um, that, that coached the boys, and his son was halfback. Right. Um, always, always, so always, always halfback, always halfback but, or first five. Eh? <laughs> but he did he did so much for us uh, for us kids. Like he was he was like a, a grumpy wee man, but he was always there for us, like every game. And it was yep. so funny. Like he'd always be yelling at the ref and stuff like that. <laughs> we we actually had a pretty like a pretty good team. Um, we had this one bloke junior. And he was two times bigger than everyone else. And Rich it was just up. pass it to Junior. He <laughs> run through 10 players, go to deck, and then Richie Monga will get the ball and he'll score. <laughs> job done. And then, yeah, job done. Easy Mate, and these days, you're, um, you obviously made the move up to the White Cat. Mm. I don't know, you probably haven't got too many games of club footy under the belt. Um, but this year might be an opportunity. Is it Varsity Waikato that you uh, have your allegiance to in the Waikato? Yep, V's up, Varsity Waikato. Um, V's up. Damo and myself went there uh, when we moved up. Um, I've only actually played a handful of games at the club, um, but those games were very memorable. Um, if you, you can probably imagine that a varsity club loves their beers, yeah. um, and that's the thing I loved about it. How good's club rugby? Like yeah. so good. You play in the Arvo, um, everyone's fizz to play, but you sit down in the changing rooms after box of beers there. You go back into the club rooms. You know, you wet the lips yep. for, for a few Waikato droughts, liquid gold, that stuff. Yeah. Waikato droughts? Waikato droughts. Droughts. I mean, a little WD-40. I thought that Sorry. was a visa Sorry, name for it, but yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm a shocker for that. Oh, mate. Um, but yeah, it's just so good. Like, I just, yeah, I hope I can go back and play um, sometime soon. And as I, as I was talking about earlier in the podcast about, I guess, the grassroots of, of rugby, like, those are those, those are the times that you love. Um, you know, going out there, giving you all for 80 with your mates, but then just sitting down in the changing rooms after having a laugh, no matter what happened, and, and having a beer with your mate. Do you get, I mean, this is probably uh, a, maybe a personal question that could put you on the spot a little bit, but I know that Sammy Kane is a, is a massive fan. He's a big, yeah. he's a massive advocate for that style of changing room. Like he, yeah. he is, yeah. you've, you've gone to battle, you've worked hard all mm. week and you've gone to battle with the boys and then you reward yourself uh, with a couple of wets uh, after the game in the shed and and I know that it's changed over time. Like I mean, I remember watching uh, after interviews after games where I think it might have even been uh, Bunty and Walter Little punching darts in the shed <laughs> after games. You know, like I'm not <laughs> saying that that's where we're at now, but, that? <laughs> but there was there was that there was a camaraderie. There were no cell phones in the sheds yeah, after a game. Yeah. Is almost the mm. point that I'm trying to make. And now there is, and I'm not saying that the that the current squad or that anyone's worse than anyone else, but there does seem to be a little bit more of sharing your sharing what's happening with the outside world before sharing it with the people that have shared the paddock with you. Is that yeah. something that's even factors into it, or is that just something that I'm just completely out on a limb thinking here? Yeah, I, I see what you mean. First of all, clear up, there's no more punching darts in the changing room. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll set the fire alarm off if you do that. It's an expensive call out <laughs> yeah, to eat a yeah. bar. That's you yeah, in that yeah, tight yeah. toilet, mate, <laughs> down underneath the FMG stand. Um, but yeah, I guess there is a little bit of that. Um, you sort of get off the field, you 
some boys get on their phones and you miss a little bit of, you know, sitting down and, and just chatting with your mates. Um, and generally you've got like sponsors coming through and stuff like that, which is fine, um, but you don't have that, that old school, back in the sheds, just the boys um, and reflect on the game. To be fair, we do, we do have beers, like there's, yep. there's an option for beers, but when I was talking about club footy is you're probably having more beers than you, you do after a super rugby game oh, or yeah. a yeah, all totally. game, so um, but yeah, there, there's a chance to have beers, um, but like you said, that that old school straight back in the sheds, just with the lads, um, has has probably gone missing a little bit. Mm. I think oh, mate, it's it's hopefully like you say this year mm. could be the opportunity with some of the abs, whether, whether they play or not, um, we'll see. But it's a, it's going to be a great opportunity to perhaps get back down to the club because you'll have buy rounds um yep. in your super footy, um, be able to you're going to spend a lot of your time. In your area, because you haven't got that travel element this year, it's going to be a lot of domestic stuff. We still don't know what's happening with the ABs. So listening to people like yourself, TJ, there's a lot of chat from those lads saying it's a great opportunity, yeah. Artie, um, to get down to your local footy mm. club and, and basically support where it all starts. It's the engine that sort of drives the game of NZ rugby. So it's going to be, um, I think, a, a really good opportunity for prof- yeah. professional rugby players to connect with that part of the New Zealand game. It's yeah. going to be awesome. Do you find that? Uh, do you find that there's always someone trying to make an example of you? That because that's the thing. Like I was talking to Greg Murphy about this and car and motor racing. It's all well and good when you go from being the top dog and you're winning Bathurst, and then all of a sudden you come back for a couple of club rounds, and there's someone there that wants to prove a point that they're <laughs> going to beat you, and they'll yeah. end up totaling his car worth quarter of a million bucks yeah. just to prove a point that doesn't exist. I'm better than you. I bet him. Do you get a little bit of that? Do you get it late and high from some of the fellas that are just out there to take a scalp? Because I know that you know Jared Hoyata, yeah. a classic example for this. Um, <laughs> but he absolutely loved yeah. it. He would love going out with a huge target on his back because he yeah. soaks that stuff up he used and gives to it back. Run around, and I can't go into the actual dialogue, <laughs> but he used to run around the field uh, chasing Brad Moore, the current <laughs> newly appointed All Black coach. Yeah. And that's a story for another day. But like um, <laughs> that is a club rugby story from from way yeah. back. He was trying to regulate those guys. Eh? Yeah, it was classic. <laughs> To, to give an example of what would happen at club rugby um, that's all fresh in our mind is probably what Colsey was doing to Bears on yeah, Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what happens when you go back to club rugby. Yeah. 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 Obviously, they're like, this guy is a super rugby player, or this guy yeah. is an all black, and they want to beat you, of yeah, course. Um, totally. It's just human nature, so you do get a bit of that, but how good? Oh, I mate, mean, how good? Yeah. How, like, literally, I've seen this before, what other professional sport in the world can the weekend warrior, the battler, the guy who does punch the odd dart and have a couple of beers yeah. play against a professional all black rugby player? It doesn't happen heaps, but it happens a wee bit. You, there's no way <laughs> the weekend battler in the UK is playing an English Premier League football player. You know, that's, yeah. that situation is never unfolding. There's no way that's happening in basketball in the States. But mm. every now and again, the stars align and someone gets to play, like back in the old days, against Jerry Collins. Richie McCaw yeah. played a couple of games for Christchurch. Anton's played five games. Yeah. The um, varsity. varsity Waikato, you know, yeah. it does happen, which is pretty cool and un- unique thing to NZ. But don't you think though, like from a from when, taking it back to the business again, would you not want to run someone like yourself against someone that wants to chop you in half and could be <laughs> it could literally take a shoulder with them, could take a knee, could do some injury that just rules you out for the rest of the year just because you're trying to feed back into the game that you love at the level in which it needs to be fed back in. Because there's checks and balances in place yeah. and it's risk and reward. And I know that if it was my checkbook that was paying your salary, <laughs> just so that you could go and steam a few uh, WD-40 tins with the lads <laughs> in the sheds afterwards, I'd be like, park it. It's not always about the tangibles, Reeve. It's not always about the tangibles. <laughs> mate, that's, that's not nice. what drives footy, all right? Yeah. Get that checkbook out of here. <laughs> nah, nah. Mate, that's a good opportunity, yeah. I reckon, to move on. And like... um. Great to chat a little bit about the the grassroots stuff and where it all started for you, Lenny. But um, you know, it wasn't long after that that you um, went along to Crotchish Boys High School, and I know footy wise, that's that was a big part of mm. um, shaping you know what we see today, mate. Was it? Um, when did it? Uh, the penny start dropping for you that um, you know? Shit, I'm okay at this, you know. Um, it was probably when a, a great man called Wayne Smith came down and. Yep. Sort of approached me after we versed Christ College, um, which is a traditional for us. Um, he came down and spoke to me about potentially moving to the Mighty Waikato, um, and I was taken back. Really, yeah. I I was having a good season, but I never thought in a million years 
I was good enough to have someone of his caliber come talk to me. Um, so that's re- when it really probably sunk in that oh I could potentially make a career out of this. I was just loving rugby. Yeah, I just loved the game regardless. So I, I'd be happy to go play club rugby and with my mates every weekend. Like that's just I just loved the game. Um, but when he came in and talked to me um, and sort of set out set out a plan and and told me where he sees me in four years' time. Um, that's when it sort of sunk in. Mm. To go back to first 15 level, who were the, who were the people that are currently playing or are in the frame at the moment that were playing that first 15 level, particularly in the South Island when yeah. when you were in the mix there? Because it wasn't, it was a pretty stacked, or we've spoken about this before, that North Island has had, you know, it moves around almost mm. regionally. Like it can be Hawke's Bay, or it can be Bay of Plenty, or it yeah. can be... Central North Island, or it could be Taranaki, or you know, more more often than not, it's Auckland and yeah. then Wellington. Uh, but for that, for whatever reason, in that sort of 2010, 2011, mm. 2012, it was heavily stacked in the south. Yeah, yeah. Just to name a few, there was at the when I was playing for team, the players that we'll know was Richie Monga, Fletcher Smith, Damien McKenzie, um, Jermaine Osako, oh, yeah. plays for the Broncos. Uh, Solomon Alamalo, um, James Tucker, Harry Miller. <laughs> Good player. Yeah, you lost me then. <laughs> <laughs> he plays for the Varsity Squids, is it? Uh, the, the Vipers. <laughs> Vipers. Vipers. Sorry. <laughs> He's a great man. It's um, a feeder club to the All Blacks, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I know I've missed a few. Um, but even like when we would play like South, like Otago Boys, they had C.O. Tonk- Tonkinson, who's playing now, uh, Josh Renton. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, it was amazing um, the talent that was coming through at the time. Like if you, yeah, if you just think of those names, um, to be playing against those players as a kid is pretty crazy. And back to the Otago Otago boys, another that's a fairly fierce rivalry in terms of you know yeah. city versus city. Uh, quite a one infamous game for you uh, would have been a South Island final. Talk yeah. us through, talk us through how that one shook down for you. Yeah, um, you got a couple of meat pies in there. Yeah, one? I got a couple of meat pies. I was, was hungry. last game, <laughs> last game in the jersey. La- last game in the blue and black hoops. Unfortunately, um, South Island final, and I think I was dotting down for the second time. I sort of reached out and dislocated my shoulder, um, and yeah, it sort of had to go off, and it was pretty disappointing. But like me as me as a kid, I was like, oh. Hopefully we'll win and I'll be playing next week. Um, you know, yeah. you just think yeah. oh, I'll be fine. Bulletproof. Um But that that wasn't the case. Unfortunately, um, we just went down to them uh, in the end, and that was my last game uh, for Christchurch Boys. Um, and it's a school I love, a school that did so much for me. I um, mean, it was an unfortunate way to end, but it is what it is. Mm. What is it that makes such a what What is it that makes such an awesome culture in that schoolboy footy? And and to that point, do you think that it's, it was, I mean, although it's not that long ago, nowadays uh, there are kids coming out of first 15 with show reels from, you know, yeah. their, all their games and, you know, put together in these, like, you know, almost sort of superstar highlights packages. Has that detracted away from what, what schoolboy footy is? Because I think it used to be almost like a distilled version or a feeder version to that club footy that we were talking yeah. about. It's about that camaraderie and it's about that school spirit. And now it has, you know, to a certain extent, and a lot of the bigger schools become about uh, poaching players from certain mm. areas, uh, bringing players in, importing players, and then distilling them down into this little highlights package that they can then on sale to either a franchise or into a, a different code altogether. Yeah, I I agree with you there. And I think the biggest problem is is that school kids think that school rugby is everything. Um, and if they don't make the first 15... Um, if they don't make New Zealand schools, they get discouraged and they might stop playing rugby. And that's what's killing club rugby, is that everything's about school rugby. The best players get picked straight away, go into their provinces or might even get a super rugby contract. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of kids think that has to happen for you to make a career out of it. But like what you do after school is the most important thing. Um, I was even if you look at the World Cup squad last year for the All Blacks, I don't even think a quarter of that team made schoolboys, like New Zealand schoolboys. Yeah. I'm not saying that New Zealand schoolboys isn't 
like a big thing. Like it's awesome to make, mm. but it's not the be all end all. Um, and that's what kids need to understand. And that's what happens when, I guess, there's so much hype around school rugby. It's on TV. Maybe the young kids get a little bit ahead of themselves, and they might get picked up. But it discourages the other kids that don't, that aren't fortunate enough to to make the first fifteen or don't make New Zealand schools. Are like, well, I'll just go to uni um, and find another pathway because I don't see myself um, making a career out of this. But kids have got to understand: there's been third fifteen rugby yeah. players, there's been second fifteen rugby players, probably even fourth fifteen rugby players that have made the All Blacks, have made two rugby, have made a career out of rugby. Um, Even Ali but, Williams, who played yeah. soccer football for yeah. a majority of his yeah. life. I think was so. it Scott Hamilton? Scott Hamilton third was 3rd-15. Uh, Luke Romano was 3rd-15, somewhere yep. around there. Dave Hewitt was, I think, 2nd, 3rd-15. Yep. You know, um, yeah, there's a heap of them who, but they stayed in the game mm. and, you know, um, if they keep playing, sometimes yep. the opportunity comes a little bit later. Yeah, and it's what you do after school. That really counts, I think. D- DC at the time, I don't even think he started New Zealand schools. Yeah, you're and right. Richie, I think Brendan McCullum did, I think, yeah. Yeah, Brendan yeah, McCullum kept started. Them on the bench. Um, Richie McCaw, he made his first team was under 19s. So is that post school? Yeah, I think he's a little bit later, eh? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, like, people blossom at different times. So, yep. to any any of the teenage kids out there, don't be discouraged from what you're doing at the moment. Um, there's always plenty of time. And if, if you work hard, if you're dedicated, uh, you'll reap the rewards. At what age should you really hang up the boots? I mean, I'm pretty inspired <laughs> after that chat, and at 37, uh, I'm pretty keen to lace up. <laughs> Mate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were just a couple of breaths. Uh, Mate. Oh, no. Mate. The thing There's is always too, hope. There's always hope. <laughs> but you keep the, um, mm. the obviously playing, playing good footy is awesome, but probably, and you've spoken about it already, the other best part of footy is doing something with a group of fellas, you know, yeah. like having um, that community, that group of lads that you kick around with, you're trying to achieve something together on the field, but you've also got a group of mates that you do things off the field as well and can form good relationships with. And that's why, um, you know, sometimes it's tragic to see young fellas drop away when, yeah. you know, hey, if it only ends up being senior rugby or, or something else, that's still um, such a good environment for young fellas to be in, I reckon. Yeah, like how good, like I'm saying, I wish I could play senior rugby, like go do more of that. Because the culture is so good, and it's a shame to see that there's only two sides now. There's normally like a premiership side, yeah, yeah, and then a senior B side. Like when I was a young kid, there used to be like my old man used to play for this Golden Oldies team. It was about the tenth senior yeah. men's team at Maris Albion. <laughs> yeah, but Colts it's just, teams. Yeah, it's yeah, Colts was really strong. It's just so unfortunate to see that drop away. But like, it's such an awesome environment to be in to go to training Tuesday, Thursday to go to the club rooms on Saturday after game. Like that's a, those are connections there. Um those are like those are friendships you'll have for life. And yeah. that's what I've that's what I always get told from players retiring. They say you ask them what's the best thing you did during footy? And they said it's the connections I made, the best mates yeah, I yeah. made. Hundred percent. Um obviously it was cool playing rugby, but it was the friendships they made in that time. There's nothing better then going down to club rugby on a Saturday afternoon and then afterwards watching one of your mates get up and try and do the post-match speech and <laughs> oh, just yeah. ruining it. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely yeah. bullsing it up. You know, mm. like he's all cock in the shed and he's got huge chat and then put him up in front of a crowd and it's all a game of two halves and thanks for the ladies yeah. for the afternoon tea and just mm. butchers it. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. Well, I think growing up in the Bay and uh, and my first junior club in the Bay, Tapuna, is, is the club in which round he's at now. Um and just to see for that, the, the cultural aspect as well, when you see those big traditionals, Tapuna versus Rangatawa, I mean, Tapuna versus basically any team is a, is a traditional big one. And the hucker that comes out and the way mm. that the people line the fields and sit up on the top of the embankment and toot horns when the, mm. when the tries are scored. And it's it's exactly that. You play in the morning and then you stay at the club rooms and you get a pun of hot chips <laughs> and something that's loaded up with sugar and probably not great for you, but it'll keep you going for the rest of the day. <laughs> and then you watch the Colts play and then it all ramps up until that that senior level of footy it is it, that's where the the for me the culture of rugby is defined at that, yeah. at that level because mm. it's all encapsulating it's not about it's not about money it's not about anything other than representing the jersey in which you're playing and being part of a community and 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 representing yourself and your family well exactly like that's the foundation of New Zealand rugby and that's what I want to see thrive again um and hopefully through this whole covid restructure um, we can put 
I guess, more resources and I guess they allow players to go back in there to, to give club rugby a chance to thrive again. Mm. Mate, for you though, um, you know, um, it all started happening pretty quick and, and we'll fast forward a little bit to, you know, when you got your, your Chiefs debut, which was is a little bit of an unusual one really um, because you're sort of, I mean, talk us through it, mate, because you're sort of wider training squad and then before you know it, you're at one of the hot houses of Blimmin' World Rugby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in uh, 2014, Renz and Smithy sort of took a punt on me. So as we talked about before, I dislocated my shoulder in my last game at Christchurch Boys. Um, I really wanted to play Condor 7s, so I tried to rehab it the whole time. Got to Condor 7s and then the physio was like, nah, it's not good enough. Rehab it for another three months, you'll be sweet. So I did all of that and by this time I was living up in Hamilton. Um, that weekend I was supposed to play for Waikato Varsity. Um, but at training I dislocated my shoulder again. Uh, just making a tackle, so obviously it hadn't quite recovered. Um, had to get surgery, um, and then I was out for that whole year because by the time I was back, it was November, there was no more rugby. Um, and Smithy and Wren said, we really want you to come in um, and be a part of a wider training group because we want to speed up your, your progress as a player. And um, that's the sort of men they are. They promised me that they'll look after me, um, and they did. Um, so I was really lucky to have them uh, on board. So I went into the Chiefs wider training group and they said, we'll put you in there, but don't worry. Um, it'll be a year of development. You won't play. We've got plenty of midfielders. We've got plenty of wingers. Sweet. Um, but when you say that, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they jinxed themselves <laughs> because every man and his dog um, went down at the Chiefs. Um, I think it was about five rounds in. Uh I'd actually, I played a couple of pre-season games, yep. so I I got a, a bit of a feel for it, um, and then my opportunity came, they're like, we're going to play on the wing this week uh, against the Bulls at Loftus in South Africa. And that is a that is a pressure cooker <clears throat> scenario, and yeah. that, is, <laughs> that is some large humans. Yeah. How much time had you spent on the wing? Um, I'd play there, played there about three times during school, um, so <laughs> I, was, I was a midfielder, but to, in all honesty... I was a very light midfielder, and and at that time, Sonny Bill was there, and he was, or well, he'd just left. He was back at the Roosters, maybe. Or maybe he was around. Maybe Walking. he was injured. Um, but anyways, but all their moves was nine to twelve. <laughs> 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 but so I was about ninety five kgs at this time, <laughs> and my biggest strength was like sort of footwork. Yep. So all the moves didn't really suit me. So I think in preseason, nine to twelve, hit it up. Bang, <laughs> just got smothered. Um, but anyways, they put me on the wing. Um, hadn't played a lot there. I was extremely nervous. But at the same time, I was excited. Um, and I was a bit naive. Like I was like, cause I thought, growing up, I thought like Super Rugby is the be-all, end-all. Because I'd been in New Zealand, like a small country. I was like, Super Rugby is sweet. Like the whole world's watching. I've got 7 billion people watching me like this. <laughs> 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 Like, cause I just I thought like rugby was the the biggest sport in the world. Yeah. Um. Obviously, as I got a bit older, I realised it wasn't. Um. And I was like, I'm gonna make my family proud. Um. I think I was single at the time, so I was like, sweet. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> this is, is ticking put, boxes. Put on TV a show. On. Um. <laughs> And then I had a bit of a shocker. <laughs> yeah, I, t- I, do re- yeah. I do recall a couple of uh, very young-minded actions that probably could have almost cost you the game yeah. if it wasn't yeah. for a terrible set of hands. What happened there? Yeah, I, I think I missed a, a tackle. Then I did a quick throw-in about 50 metres and it nearly got intercepted. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a tough debut. So I went from this little kid being so excited about the game to... To being like mortified, like, I was so disappointed in myself, and and honestly, like, I went to a, a pretty dark place because I was like, I've just like I've just embarrassed myself in front of seven billion people. <laughs> it's probably it was probably about seven hundred, <laughs> seven hundred thousand or something. Um, let my family down, let my teammates down, and and for me, like I really wanted to prove to the team that like I was worthy, um, and that that was the biggest slip down. Like I had some of my heroes there, and. Obviously, the game didn't go too well, and it was it was it was a really tough time uh, to get over that. But it was a learning like I wouldn't change for the world. Yep. Um, and yeah, I went to a pretty dark place. It actually took me a long time to recover from that. 
Um, I lost a lot of confidence, not just as a rugby player, but in myself. Um, but like I said, like, I wouldn't change that experience for the world because it made me stronger and it gave me great learnings for further down the track. It's a little bit of that impersonated, mm. impersonation theory or whatever it was, and there's a, a number of players that have spoken about it where you're sitting in the sheds as a young buck and you're looking around just going, I'm surrounded by people that I've watched on screen my whole life, and then yeah. you get out there and something like that happens – which everyone would do a million times over. But when it's on your first game and you're the young guy and you're the one that's been roped in, how do you get your head right after that? Did you have uh, some great leadership in and around you? Did you have the other lads that kind of helped pull you out? Because it's pretty easy, and, and a lot of people don't actually know this, about how, how much professional sports people beat themselves up about something as insignificant as that yeah. for, the, for a long time, like you just mentioned. Yeah, like at the time, I sort of just kept it to myself. Um, I guess I saw telling someone about it like a weakness, um, but I know now that it's that it's not at all. Like I love talking about vulnerability because to open up is the absolute strength. Um, but at the time, I I didn't have those tools. I didn't have that knowledge, so I kept it to myself. I let it boil away for a long time. Like I let for the whole year um, until I went to under twenties that year. And that's where I sort of started to regain some confidence again in my rugby game. And back then, I attached my emotions to how I performed. Yep. Um, so, it, like, if I had a, a bad game, that's how I thought I was a, as a person. Like I'd walk around the room and be like, oh, these guys think like I'm a, like an idiot or I'm a... That is terrible <laughs> language, you know. But they would be absolutely not thinking like that. But yeah. that's what was going through my head, um, and it took me a couple years until probably I got to a pretty, a pretty like a dark stage in my life where I thought, like, I can't keep living this way. Well, I was actually I was ready to, you know, like chuck and tell, like hang and up weren't the boots. you? I've heard you say before, it wasn't fitness. It wasn't like you were as yeah, fit yeah, as yeah. you've ever been. Yeah, and. I think we talked about in in a podcast we've done before is like I was working incredibly hard. Um, I was probably at my fittest I've ever been. My skinnies were low, um, but I was a little bit of a perfectionist. Like I had to nail everything um, around rugby, and rugby was my whole life. But what that did was it just consumed me. I just become this person that I have to perform all the time, and if I don't. I'm not a nice person because I didn't have a great performance um, and I didn't have any balance in my life. Um, everything was about rugby. My mind was, I would go home, be lying in bed and be thinking, oh, like, thinking about, oh, what have I got to do here? Um, should have I ate that donut because <laughs> it's going to, like, affect my skinnies. Um, and that took me to a really dark spot. Um and like I said, I, I was ready to hang up the boots. Yep. Yeah, I think I was 20 years old, living the dream, getting paid well. But I just couldn't live that way. Um, mentally, I was I was content with it because I was like, you know what, I just want to go be a builder, yep. um, have fun with my mates, have a beer, you know, have beers Thursday, Friday at the pub and just, just be normal. Um, but luckily I didn't. Um, I th at the time, like Wren's really helped me through it. Um, a few close mates, talked to mum and dad about it, my sister. Um, and there was, opening up was the start of me getting better. Um, and it wasn't for a couple of years until I did that. So that's when I say vulnerability is an ap absolute strength because as soon as you open up, it's your pathway to getting better. Um, and then from there, I really... Grew as a person, I grew in confidence. I didn't attach my emotions to my performances. I realised I got to ha have balance. I got to be myself outside of rugby, and yeah, I just I just become a lot better. And if I didn't go to that dark, yep. that dark stage, like, I wouldn't be as strong as I am now. I wouldn't have those learnings. So, always am th thankful in a way for what I went through because it's made me the person I am today. But at the same time, it it, was, it sucked to go there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, if we're going to fast forward to uh, 2016 where you debuted against the All Blacks uh, against Australia in Wellington. First touch, you managed to set up a try for Daggers. 
Det er gær. Barrett sends it to Franks in the gap. Here's Leonard Brown. Pops it over the top. And there's the opening try. Israel Dagg. Israel Dagg runs it in. But Anton Leonard Brown, your first test start, your first touch in test rugby was sensational. Oh, yeah, big rats, rats from Marsh. Yeah, it is. Big rats from Marsh. <laughs> so when you, you take yourself back to uh, the beginning of that game, when when do you feel? I mean, you've we've spoken about Super Rugby and we've talked mm. about the transition into professional rugby, but there is a massive step between uh, that level of footy and All Blacks level rugby. At what point did you go? My goodness, I am an All Black now. When did you get the call? How is the process in behind that? And and what's what's the chain of emotions that goes with that? When I like I was had to pinch myself all week, and it probably wasn't until I did the hucker, like it really sunk in. Like, yeah, well, I'm going to be all black, and I, I started. So obviously, I was just once the ball kicked off, I was like, I'm a, I'm an all black now, and into it. that's something I never thought I've always always dreamt of, but I never thought would happen. Um, and how do you how do mm. you not how do you not factor that in, or is it something that you kind of keep out of your head so that you like you played NZ twenties, skipped it. You know, like you, mm. you've you went straight out of schoolboy rugby into Super Rugby. You are, a, you were a phenom. You were, you had a rapid rise throughout that. Do you keep it away from yourself to maybe save yourself the disappointment if something doesn't go, doesn't go your way and it doesn't end up happening because it is the loftiest of heights to aim for. But at the same time, you go like when I was playing when I was playing schoolboy footy, I knew I wasn't going to be an All Black yeah, yeah. because of the way that I was playing my code. You yeah. must have had an indication that, and you made it young. Like there was a bunch of you that came through and made it at a really young age. Yeah, I I think I'm just sort of a person that like goes with the flow. Um, like I always dreamt of being all black, but I I think you nailed it on the head. Like I didn't want to say I'm going to be an all black, or because I was scared of letting myself down. Like what if I didn't make that? Yep. Um, and that probably wasn't a great mindset to have because I guess I let fear get in the way. But it happened, uh, fortunately. But now I, I think differently. Like I have, I set my my visions or my goals really high. Things that I might not never reach, but it makes me train harder. It keeps me accountable. Um, but at the time, I didn't have that. I guess that knowledge. Um, it sort of just it all happened. Um, and just what I talked about. You know how I was talking about like learnings um, from my debut as a chief. Um, sort of. My All Blacks debut happened the same way. I was sort of thrust in yep. into a debut role. I wasn't in the official squad. Then I was an injury cover member for Sunny Bill. And then I was put in the squad. Um, Crots went down. Was it? Crots went down. And then the next week I was starting. Um, and I actually remember thinking when I got named, I was like, here I am again. I'm back at I'm, at, I'm back at Loftus. <laughs> oh, no. Like, and then and then it's yeah. those key learnings from that to not actually yeah. get yourself back but in that situation. All, but the All Blacks like they give you so much so much confidence. Um, they don't say too much. Um, they don't like overfill your mind. They just want you to express yourself as a player, and it, it's such a good environment. But one thing they also say is all we need you to do is do your job, because. Um, and the best thing about the All Blacks is you got world class class players all around you, and they're doing their job. Um, so that's what I was thinking all week: just do my job. But one promise I made to myself in a learning from my debut in Loftus uh, for the Chiefs was: I went into my shower, and I was really uh, annoyed with myself because as soon as I made a mistake, I was I was fearful of making another one. Um, so I didn't fully express myself as a player. I didn't put out what I should have um, but that was one promise I made to myself on my All Blacks debut I said no matter what happens if I drop the first ball I'm going to express myself the whole game um, I could have the worst game in the world here but I'm just going to go out there and enjoy it and fortunately enough having that mindset allowed me to to be free and I was probably really lucky to first touch the ball yeah. have a try assist <laughs> like yeah. the amount of confidence I grew from that yeah. Um, yeah. Was was massive, um, but you know, just like I said, just you know, there's there's always a reason for everything, yep. um, and probably that All Blacks debut was like the moment where I was like, all that hard work I put in, all those dark times I had, but pushed through it, made it all worth it. I was like, it was for this moment, um, 
I went through so many years of frustration. I was like, why? I'm, like, I'm working so hard. I'm not reaping the rewards. But three years down the track, I did. And then we, and then we uh, catch up in, in Japan and what was looking like, I think, for all money, it was looking like you guys were going to steamroll through again and you run into England and this happens. Yeah. Bang it in close here through Laws. They pick and go and they're over. It is a rapid strike for England and Manu Chualangi's name. And it's England who come away as winners. Mate, I was sitting in the sitting in the crowd, lucky enough to be sitting in the crowd, having uh, gone over as a, a Vodafone representative to bring the game back to the fans. And my oh, geez, did I do a great job of that? I have to say now, uh, yeah. but it was it was a tough one to watch. I can't imagine what it was like to be on the field. Did it, did it just feel like there was nothing that you could do to stop this team rolling through? Because the performance against Ireland was, you know, spectacular. Mm. Did you feel like you maybe emptied the tank there a little bit? Yeah, I've I've thought about this, you know, a thousand times now. I've gone through it in my head and, you know, I still don't have all the answers. Um, and I can only speak, you know, from my opinion because every player in the team and, and the coaches might have a different one, but... You know, so when you play, when you have such a dominant performance against a team the week before, and that was Ireland, the hardest thing to do, and I know it was a semi-final sometimes, is to back that up. And we talked about it all week, like we can't be complacent, like we've only just, we've beat Ireland, but that's only the quarter-final. You do all the mental work to not be thinking of that, but subconsciously, there's always something in the back of your, you know, like you're not thinking it, but it might be there. Yeah. Like I was thinking... Like was my intensity at training not as good as the the week before? Like I don't know. I can't I can't answer that. Um, but yeah, it just it was just that feeling like England played outstandingly well, and we were just slightly off. We were one two percent off, um, and yeah, they they dominated us. That they, they played exceptionally well, and we didn't really have too many answers. Um, but in in a black jersey, like. Five minutes to go. I know yep. well, we can score two two yep. quick tries here. Like there was no panic. Um and Rito's a great captain for that. You know, he he's very calm, we're very process driven. Like we know we've just got to stick to our systems. And it wasn't until the last two minutes I was like, like, you know, we're probably gonna lose here. I mean that's when it it really sunk in. But yeah, you know, I, I wish I could go back and, and do it all again, but yeah, I, I, I don't have the answers to why. Um, but yeah, just on the day, we were, we were slightly off and England were on and, and that's what happens. Mm. That is that is the beauty of rugby. And it was uh, uh, and it was impressive to see. And then obviously the, the week after, mm. you have to back it up and then you have to go out and you effectively, well, not that you'd go out knowing that you were going to win, but there was just a sort of a grit and determination mm. That the team took to the paddock with, and absolutely dished out a, a good old fashioned hiding, and because you, you basically have to close the chapter there and and move on, was that part of the determining factor for you to re-sign again and make sure that your commitment to New Zealand rugby was going to put you in the best frame to go back and almost avenge it? Because we've heard Richie McCaw talk about it. Uh, getting knocked out of the World Cup was one of the greatest things that ever happened to him. And not that he would say that it was the funnest time of his life, but in terms of how it formed his mind in and around rugby and that group of players, because at that stage, like a lot of players that jumped on, it was a juggernaut team that was the All Blacks were rolling through everyone. You yeah. would never have thought that we were going to lose that. I had I had, <laughs> I had, had pretty much designed a celebration dance uh, and figured out how I was going to get my hands on that cup eventually. <laughs> yeah. Is that what, now you come back and you've got to put yourself in the frame to make sure that uh, that doesn't happen again? Yeah, I guess there's that motivation there, but I think regardless of what happened, like whether we won it or not, um, I would have come back. I'm 25 years old and I love playing rugby here in New Zealand, so I would have signed anyways. But yeah, like if I'm lucky enough to go to another World Cup, and you know, I I realise that you know being an All Black. It's a privilege, like it's not a given. Um, so I realise I've got to put a lot of work in 
over the next years. But if I get the opportunity again, um, I'll be stronger for it for sure. And who knows? We could be standing outside the uh, the hotel um, signing autographs. I'll be there again as Ryan Crotty and mm, uh, and just yeah. teeing out autographs for yeah. for the Japanese adoring fans. <laughs> I used to yeah. uh, Nick Evans is my go-to if I'm trying to uh, <laughs> pretend. You know, at least sort of. You know, mm. I had a lot of passion for him because he's quite a small white guy. So I was all about him. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so just uh, sharing what's in your bedroom yeah, on, the, on yeah, the walls there. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. Oh, well, thank you very, very much. We'll wrap it up there. Anton Leonard Brown, the official New Zealand Rugby Podcast, Episode 1, Done and Dusted. And remember, if you're a Vodafone customer, head along to Vodafone Rewards for your chance to win a signed All Blacks rugby jersey. Uh, Go well, go long. Good luck against the Blues this weekend. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure.